So we're still thinking about complete markets. Let's go back and look at the investors in a complete market. What's the investor's problem? Well, here's our friend the utility function, max utility plus expected utility tomorrow. And I'm going to write his budget constraint now as today's consumption plus the discounted value of tomorrow's consumption equals initial wealth. Now let's look at that a little more carefully. What I mean by expected utility is the sum over states, probability of each state, times the utility of consumption in that state. The budget constraint, what do we mean, why is that the budget constraint? Why is the discounted value of future consumption show up? Well, in a complete market, what the consumer does is goes out today and buys contingent claims to future consumption in every state tomorrow. So that he has to go out and buy contingent claim for rain, how much he wants to eat if it's rain, contingent rain for shine, how much he wants to eat if it shines, and so on and so forth. So the meaning of expected discounted consumption in a complete market is the contingent claim value, buying enough today, and then you just exercise those contingent claims tomorrow. Okay, with that stated as the consumer's objective and constraint, all you have to do now is take partial derivatives with respect to today's consumption and with consumption in each state in the future to find the first order conditions. And the first order conditions are just that the discount factor in each state, the probability, the uh, contingent claims price divided by probability, is uh, marginal utility in each state. So we often write that as mt plus 1 is beta u prime of ct plus 1 over u prime of ct, but watch out. When we say two random variables are equal, that means in each state they're equal, not just they're equal on average or something of the sort. We can also divide the things at time t plus 1. This expresses time t to time t plus 1 in a particular state. Rather than thinking about time t to time t plus 1 in a particular state, why don't we think about one state versus another at time t plus 1? And I've graphed that here. This is the underlying way we think now about investors choosing among risky possibilities. Uh, the price line that they face is the ratio of uh, discount factors or contingent claims prices divided by probabilities. And then the statement that marginal utility equals this uh, marginal rate of substitution equals that price ratio just shows up like this. There's the price ratio. There's the indifference curve. There's marginal rate of substitution. There's the consumer's choice of consumption in state one versus consumption in state two. There is our consumer taking on some risk, in this case, a little less in state one and a little more in state two, uh, in response to price ratios. That's a fundamentally different view. This is what, what has happened to asset pricing. Uh, in the 1950s, we might have put utility of, of Google and Microsoft. Well, they didn't exist. It would have been GM and Ford, and thought about utility of different stocks. That's not, that's not, how, we think about, that's not how we think about microeconomics and stocks. The first round of finance thought about means and variances as things investors cared about. There was utility for means and variances and the mean variance frontier and all, all that sort of thing. Uh, now the, the cleanest treatment, that isn't wrong, it's a special case. The cleanest treatment that we'll follow is to put on the axis payoff in state one, payoff in state two, and then traditional apples and oranges microeconomics just applies perfectly and simply. That's a lot simpler than this, although really there's a lot more axes uh, because there's many more states of nature. So what have we learned? Uh, that price equals expected discounted payoff, that statement really doesn't involve a lot of utility functions. That's just the bundling of contingent claims. Where utility functions come in is in how investors set marginal utility equal to the contingent claims uh, price vector that they face. And in equilibrium, how that contingent claims price vector has to adjust. Second thing we've learned from looking at this, now quite typically investors have positive marginal utility. Uh, they always want a little bit more. That implies, if that's true, then we know they must face uh, in equilibrium a market where the marginal rate of substitution, where the discount factor is positive in every state of nature. So that came up already. I, I claimed that the uh, risk neutral probabilities were always positive. How did I know that? Well, because original probabilities are always positive and because marginal utility is always positive. So looking at this tells us something else. It tells us that the discount factor is going to be a, a, a random variable that's always positive no matter what happens, so long as it's connected to marginal utility.